Greetings and welcome back to another episode of Becoming Undone, the podcast for those who dare bravely, risk mightily, and grow relentlessly. Join me, Toby Brooks, as I invite a new guest each week so that we can examine how high achievers can transform from falling apart to falling into place. This week, I am super excited. We've got a fantastic guest, just finished his book, and great stories. But Jacob Slicker is joining us, a drummer of Semisonic. I almost said former drummer, but new music coming out this month. So we'll get to that a little bit later. But Jacob, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Toby. As I shared with you off camera before we started, this podcast is really about how we can take things that the world would view as setback and kind of reframe them and talk about how they set us up for success. So I always start off with a little bit of a softball. What did you want to be growing up and why? It's morphed. I think when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an archaeologist. And that may have been because I was digging in the garden with my mom. And I, I like just getting my hands in the dirt and all of that stuff. And then I think for a while, I thought about being an architect because we knew an architect. And I had seen some of the models of houses and buildings that he had designed. And I thought, oh, that's cool, like thinking about space and three-dimensional stuff. All the while I had been playing music, but it was not until I got into a band in high school with some very serious and much better musicians that it occurred to me that that music, becoming a musician was something that not only I could do, but as I got rolling in that band, I realized it really was what I wanted to do. So I think yeah. I realized that I wanted to be a musician somewhere around the age of 15. That's great. Yeah, I know you mentioned in the book how uh, it was a, a diverse group. You were the only, I believe, white member of an all-black funk band. Uh, yeah, for the first iteration of it, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you end up going to Harvard to study in an area maybe related. To, did your early formative musical experiences influence that pursuit, or was it uh, different altogether? No, those that was definitely part of it. So in college, I ma majored in Afro-American studies and history. And I think part of that was definitely shaped by my experiences playing in a mainly Black band. It was also shaped by my grade school lessons in Black history, the civil rights movements, and things going all the way back to slavery and things like that. So I just, the, the subject matter had always felt very important and in terms of like how I was looking out at the world. And as a music listener, I really had gravitated to Black artists. And so I think when I got to college, I started reading Black writers who were talking about how their art intersected with how they think about the world at large. And those were very much questions that were on my mind. So that was all kind of part of what led to that decision. That's great. I, we have that in common as well, not on the scale of yours, but I was the a white drummer in an all-black church, and it was a running joke that the guy with the least amount of rhythm was up there leading the rhythm section. <laughs> That's great. There's, there is a great tradition of white drummers playing in black bands. Greg Errico, Sly and the Family Stone was not all black, but it was mainly black, and Greg Errico was the drummer for a while, and then Andy Newmark. And then, of course, th it goes the other way, too. I think there are so many great rock musicians who are black, and I think a lot of people wrongly assume that rock and roll, though it was first black, is now mainly a white art form, and I really heavily dispute that. Yeah. I've been trying unsuccessfully to get Will Calhoun on the show. Big inspiration for me, oh, Living yeah. Color, and uh, that group was transformative for me. I find it ironic because I was a late adopter of your band and your music because I gravitated toward Black bands, too. I had Garfield Bright, who went on to get a Ph.D. He was in the group Shy. That early to mid-90s R&B was really where I hung my hat as a, a listener to music. But uh, I love the fact that those early influences you can still, you can smell them in the recording and you definitely got chops that were formed in the, that funk and R&B stream. Yeah, I was definitely highly influenced by drummers like James Gadson and Earl Young and some of the, the studio soul and R&B drummers of the 70s were a major, and Fred White of Earth, Wind & Fire, people like that were all big, um, 
sort of influences on how I think about drumming still. Yeah. Semisonic just jumps on the scene, right? Overnight success. Uh, that was years in the making, as so often is the case. And, and your bandmates had, had been involved in a group of their own. And so I guess start at the beginning of your semisonic journey and, and wherever that is for you. I had graduated from college in the mid 80s and had moved to San Francisco with the idea of pursuing a career in music, but it just wasn't happening. And meanwhile, my friend Dan Wilson, who I had been in bands with, had moved to Minneapolis and was playing in a band called Trip Shakespeare, which had been started by his brother. And they were amazing. And when Dan got married, I visited Minneapolis. I went to the wedding and I visited Minneapolis and I thought, this feels like a more promising place for me. So I packed up and moved to the Midwest from San Francisco. And I was outsider in Minneapolis, but it's a very friendly place. And I started doing things like arranging, doing arrangements and demo production for people. And I would do string arrangements for studio things. And I was writing and recording my own songs and performing them in open mics and with various people. And then Dan's band, Trip Shakespeare, hit a, a, a number of sort of speed bumps and eventually ended up disbanding. And by then, of course, I'd gotten to know all the members of that band, Dan's brother, Matt, the drummer, Elaine Harris, who's amazing, and also the bass player, John Munson. And Dan and John and I had started making music together almost as a side project to Trip Shakespeare. But when Trip Shakespeare disbanded, we just decided to go all in on our trio, which was originally called Pleasure, but then was later changed, the band name was later changed to Semisonic. And... Because Trip Shakespeare had been on a major label, a and Records, and because they'd gone through the shopping process of meeting people from other labels, Dan and John both knew people from the business. We actually were plugged in at that level pretty early on. And so it wasn't long before, I, within a year, and our people from various labels are coming out to see us. And like within a year and a half, we were signed. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Early on, you're still determining whether or not you're going to be the drummer. Are they going to cut me? Am I going to have a place? And then you start touring the country in a van with your bandmates. And then not long after that, you were in a bus tour with Soul Asylum and Matchbox 20. I'm curious to know, was there ever like a thought process that made you realize like what I've accomplished is pretty awesome so far, or were you always future minded in terms of, I want to get that bus tour like Matchbox 20. We want a headline. Talk me through that process for you as an artist. It's interesting because really where my head was, because I was experiencing a lot of stage fright. So the speed at which we got attention and audiences was such that I, I was dealing with a lot of stage fright and imposter syndrome. And because it just all came so quickly. And I think my main thought was, I don't want to blow this for Dan and John. And I was going on stage every night and thinking, don't let this be the night I have a meltdown. Don't let this be the night I have a meltdown. And I think that I wasn't even thinking about what are my own personal goals right at, at the beginning. I was more like thinking, don't blow this, don't screw it up, which is not a great headspace to be in, but it was where I was at. Yeah. I think that once we got done with our first album cycle, so we, we recorded a record, which was a critically acclaimed commercial disaster called Great Divide. And it's a great record. I, I still love it. And I think our fans really love that record a lot. Once we got done with that, and I had been around the circuit once, I would made a lap around the track, as it were. Then I started to think in terms of, damn it all, here's what I want. I want us to have, I want us to get successful. And I, I went from being on defense to being on offense. Yeah. So I think that's when I shifted over. Yeah. 
So that transforms from a bus tour uh, in the U.S. to international success. Closing time is everywhere. It is played at the end of realtor conferences and for yeah. relief pitchers who come in. And yeah. while children are being born, what was that like to, to go from that first effort to pour your heart in and not see it translate into commercial success? And then all of a sudden you've got this song that is literally everywhere. It was exciting. It was validating. At the time, I was in my mid-30s, and that's a point at which you think you're over the hill. But I, things were just beginning for us. I felt like, at last, now I can hold my head up about what my <laughs> chosen career was. I think that's a mistaken idea, by the way. But at the time, that's how I viewed it. Mm -hmm. um, and... The, I would never stop hearing. And, and even to this day, people send me if the radio is playing closing time or if someone in the UK hears Secret Smile, which was a big hit around the world. I get emails and messages all the time from people I know. Hey, you heard the song again. I think what I what it is now is it's this incredible gift of feeling like you were part of something that is now part of the sort of larger cultural mindset or something. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was without a doubt a phenomenon and it, it, it probably planted a seed within you and your bandmates that there's more closing times in our tank. We're, oh. we're going to continue to leverage and build upon this success. Absolutely. I thought, oh, now we figured it out now, or, or now they figured us out. And now they'll know that we have lots of great music, but it didn't work that way. And I think that by the time our, our, our third record came out, the singles did not do as well as Closing Time and Secret Smile had. And as a result, by eight months after the record came out, we had just decided the record company told us we're not supporting the record anymore. And we just decided to take a break. At the time, I felt wronged. I felt frustrated. I was angry. I felt like the record company had blown it. And I felt denied something that had been rightfully mine. And it took writing the book and really sitting back and taking a longer view of things to understand that our story was not one of a frustrating career that got away from us. It was a story of improbable success and something for which I ought to be exceedingly grateful. Because if I'm not grateful, then I just lose it. I can't have it unless I'm grateful for it. And, and I, I definitely am grateful for it. So I think that was an important kind of shift for me to recognize that worldly standards of success. It was at that, that point that I realized that my earlier self who had said, oh, finally, we have a number one hit, had missed the point. Mm -hmm. Like our success had actually come much earlier. And it was just merely the fact that we had an audience and that we had a band and we were making music that really spoke for us. And we had a process that through which our songs and our musical ideas had an outlet. And that's really the sort of definition of artistic success for me. Commercial success is utterly separate from that. Right. I think that's so well said that uh, you mentioned that it was an unlikely success. I think it's safe to say that you all were reluctant superstars in many ways. You weren't the type that would throw a temper tantrum because uh, I, something was running behind schedule or you didn't insist on your own way. And in some ways that may have allowed you to be taken advantage of or maybe not given the due that was maybe rightfully yours. It's almost like nice guys finish last. Did, did you get a sense of that? Sometimes there were situations where I thought our amenability cost us respect points, but you really can't do it any other way than just be who you are. Mm -hmm. I think people who have some swag in them and who just move that way should move that way. For us, I don't know if it's our Midwestern programming or what it was, but 
we just weren't like that. And I think that any attempt to be something other than who you are gets you, derails you. I, I don't think we could have done it any other way and have it work. Yeah. Third studio album came out in 2001. The book came out in five or six. So what was that space in between? You said the book was in many ways therapeutic for you. <laughs> what what happened in, in the interim between the, the third album and the book? The writing of the book. Um, so it took me a couple of years to write it. And... While I was writing the book, I was talking with a couple of friends who were writers. My wife is one of them. A good friend of mine who's a editor at the Wall Street Journal was another. And my book agents. And as I would show them chapters and think about it and answer their questions and hear their responses, it was all giving me much more perspective on what I had just been through. So I think that in addition to writing the book, what was going on was a lot of re-evaluation of what my life had been up to that point. That's great. I think for a lot of people to experience the success, certainly on the scale that you did, that's once in a lifetime and you can't help but be thankful and grateful for that. But then there's also a seed that makes you think, there was more in the tank. I, we could have, we should have, we would have done different <laughs> things. And and so how would you describe the emotions associated with that closure of that season of your artistry came to a halt? How would you describe the emotions that, that followed that? I think the book, I think any writing that is worth doing is going to force you to reconsider what you are writing about. Mm -hmm. that's why you write like you don't write to just transcribe what's already in your mind you write to figure it out and so i think that that's part of it i also think that while we were i remember very distinctly we were flying to the uk to play a sold out show in london and we were writing business class and I was in my business class seat and we had just taken off from Minneapolis and I was reclining and I thought, wow, we're flying to play our number one song at a sold out club in London and I'm flying business class. I am so grateful. And about 10 seconds later, this voice in the back of my head said, you asshole, it took you that to be grateful. And I was like, oh my God. And then I started doing an inventory of all the things in my life for which I really ought to be grateful that had nothing to do with status or worldly measures of achievements and value. And, and I wrote a bunch of thank you letters, actually, when I got back to Minneapolis. And that was like a, that was one very important moment in my sort of arc of understanding, like, wow, you've really got to start paying better attention to all of the things that you have. And instead of identifying a few sort of things that get a lot of buzz and attention that you don't have, mm -hmm. focus on all of the riches that are in your life right now and be thankful for them because only by being thankful for them can you have them. That's so powerful. I read a quote to my students earlier in the week about how it's cognitively impossible to experience stress and gratitude at the same time. It is not feasible within the circuitry of our neurology to simultaneously process stress and gratitude. Yeah. And that for me was so eye opening. If I'm stressed, just stop for a moment and be thankful for what I have accomplished or what I have seen. We don't hear much from the band, an EP here and there, a single here and there. And then suddenly, 20 years later, out comes a new album. A little bit of sun on Pleasure Sonic, which I gather that's maybe your own label from Pleasure and, and Simasonic. So much has changed since the first three albums. The, the entire music industry has changed. MTV isn't what it used to be. I loved this description of the album, that it looks at the past with appreciation rather than longing. And I think a lot of times we can be introspective, but then we can come across like that sad high school jock still wearing his varsity letter jacket around 40 years later. This is not that. 
talk to me about the new album, where the genesis for that idea came from and what it means to you. I think that we had always been intending to make more music. You know, when we took a break in 2001, we were not disbanding, but we moved. We all eventually moved to different cities. John stayed in Minneapolis, but Dan lives in L.A. and I live in New York. Um, Dan uh, has this amazing career as a Grammy winning songwriter, producer, He's co-written smashes for Adele and the Dixie Chicks, and he's nominated for best song this year for a song he wrote with John Baptiste, and he's nominated for best country song for a song he wrote with Chris Stapleton. So he's had this incredible career as a songwriter, and so all of that was happening. And then John has this amazing sort of jazz trio in Minneapolis that plays punk rock and indie classics so it's upright bass piano vibes and they're playing london calling and hey ya by outcast and you know all kinds of music they're not old standards they're new standards and so he's been doing that and he's you know he's done a lot of things on public radio and things like that and then i moved to new york and wrote a book and became a teacher at sarah lawrence so we all had these different lives going on, but all the while we were on the phone with each other all the time saying, hey, when are we going to get back together again? And I think what happened was Dan started accumulating a pile of songs that actually felt like semi-sonic songs instead of Adele songs or not a surf songs or any of the artists with whom he had been collaborating. They, they, they really sounded like semi-sonic. We started getting together in, I think, like 2017-ish to start recording what became our EP that came out in 2020, which is called You're Not Alone. And then the ball just kept rolling, and we, the songs just kept coming, and we got together more and kept recording. And as has always been the case, Dan writes way more songs than we can ever fit onto an album. And so there's a lot more recording than there is visible output in terms of what the public sees but you know that this has been we've been waiting for it and in the past five years or so we've really started making it happen and of course last summer we toured with the bare naked ladies and delamitri and we've been playing shows in minneapolis and here and there and i think that the the time was right there was a sort of we just had to wait for the planets to line back up again, and they did. Yeah, the album's great, and I, I love just how positive and, and, and how through the lyrics and, and the music as well, how you're able to look back on those experiences you had as this world-traveling rock band and recognize that there were human elements to that as well. And, and uh, it, it really is a, a, a fantastic listen, so congrats on that. Thank you. How would you say you're different as a result of what you've been through? Had you just gone straight from Harvard, finishing your degree into a teaching career? How, how has this, this foray into rock stardom changed you as a human being? I think that, I don't know about the stardom part. We never really were stars. We were near stars, but our songs were the stars. So everybody knows our songs, but people generally don't know our faces. Um, especially mine. I think some people know Dan and John just because of their sort of slightly higher profile in the world. But I would say that one thing that experience really taught me was like, it doesn't come quickly and it doesn't necessarily last. And you've got to take pleasure in doing the actual work. You've got to actually enjoy the work because that's really what you have in the end. That's the only thing that's guaranteed is you get to do the work. If you don't like doing the work, it's the wrong choice. Mm. And I think that that's an important lesson. I think one thing I learned, I might have learned this in other ways, so you never know. But one thing that I learned is that showing up to do the thing is important. You've got to actually, I think that a lot of, I think creating, I think creative pursuits are daunting because generally our taste is way out in front of our chops. 
-hmm. So we have much better taste as readers than we are able to produce as writers. We have better taste as music listeners than we are able to produce as musicians, at least for the first many years of our work as artists. So you've got to be willing to just hang in there and keep showing up and just trust in the power of showing up. Yeah. So that's one thing I really stress to my students is trust me, you've got to show up. Right. I loved reading about how you're in the back of a tour bus with a rudiments book and yeah. working on just the same fundamentals that any sixth grader that's picking up sticks for the first time would learn. You're on a tour bus on a rock show. Yeah, it's fantastic. That growth never, it should never stop. If you love the process and the outcome takes care of itself many times. Yeah, I still take lessons. It's important. But there was actually one passage in the book that I stopped in my tracks and I just I huffed. My, my wife and I will, will read our respected books at the end of the day. And she's what? If you hear that breath that somebody just read something worth sharing and the quote was, I wondered if we looked special enough. And it crossed my mind that here's a band. You had a, a record deal with MCA. I could go in a store and buy your album. The thought never crossed my mind that someone with that on their resume would have a seed of doubt or imposter syndrome, or in your case, stage fright. So it's tempting to make assumptions about people based on what they've accomplished or what they've done, but we don't know the underlying thought processes going on there. You don't. And in fact, the underlying thought process is probably very much like what most people have out in the world because musicians are just taken. They're the same people that are out in the world. They just do music instead of other things. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are neurosurgeons who have terrible, like, imposter syndrome i'm sure there i know that as a teacher you can have imposter syndrome i know that there are people who as parents have imposter syndrome kids have imposter syndrome it's just out there and i think an important path to take if you're one of those people is to find someone to talk to because one of the first things you're going to find out is that people don't view you the way you view yourself. Mm -hmm. Often imposter syndrome is a protective stance to say, well, if I view myself as worse than anybody else does, then at least nobody can surprise me with their criticisms because I'll have already criticized myself. But I think that it's really important to get outside of your own head and talk to other people and find people you can trust who are good listeners with whom you can knock around this stuff. When I had stage fright now, I didn't share it with Dan and John because I certainly didn't want to freak them out. But I did have <laughs> friends who I said, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this band thing. I'm freaking out before every show and I'm having kind of panic attacks on stage. I don't, I think I, maybe I chose the wrong career. <laughs> and they were the ones who persuaded me to hang in there. And thank God they did. Find friends, find people you can trust, find trusted listeners, find counselors or therapists or wh whatever it is you need to do to get outside of the little tape loop that runs through your head. Yeah, absolutely. My daughter is a vocal performance major, and we've had this conversation several times. She's fairly introverted, and we talk about how it's a curse of a musician who isn't that extroverted life of the party person in that you want to create art. But in order for it to really feel like it matters, we need that, that affirmation from an audience of some sort. But if I'm not necessarily really driven to put that out there or I'm, I'm terrified, my imposter syndrome tells me that they're not going to like it, they're going to reject it, then that's a really lonely place to live. It is a lonely place to live. And I think that there are certain things that artists have to reconcile themselves to. Number one, your art will be rejected. It, it, people will not like it. There are people who will not like it. And a lot of those people are the very first people who will hear what you're doing. And you have to know that ahead of time. And you actually have to build that into your expectation because that's it's just structured that way. You're not going to be that good as you start out. The first people you perform in front of are going to be people who are going to be embarrassed for you. 
and that's also just that's a universal experience of artists everywhere and i think every musician for instance has had the experience of playing a recording of their music for their family and the minute they press play someone in their family gets up and says who wants ice cream they just can't handle being in the room with what you've done so i think that's like part of what you've got to expect and i think that you've also just got to expect that you're gonna have to hang in there and get your butt kicked mm -hmm. And that if you do that, you're going to get better. And it's worth tracking the careers of sort of some of your favorite artists and noting that a lot of them weren't great right away. They were good or maybe okay, but people do get better. And you've got to, you have to have faith in growth. Yeah. And what growth demands, you absolutely must have faith in growth. Otherwise, you just can't do it. And in order to have growth, there has to be self-forgiveness and self-compassion built in. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to grow without it. Because if you don't have that, you become intolerable to yourself. And then you just can't even face what you're doing and what you're trying to get better at. So you've got to learn how to have compassion for yourself. And you've also got to learn how to, th this, you've got to walk this fine line of knowing that growth requires compassion and persistence. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have the persistence coach on one shoulder and the compassionate person on the other shoulder. And they have to work as a team to help you continue on. Yeah, that's a fine balance to strike. I think yeah. a lot of folks are perfectionist by nature and they want to produce art that, that the world loves. But that can lead you to a dark place and feeling like you don't measure up or that it was a failure or that people just don't like what you're bringing into the world. I, I, and I think that another important thing to recognize is that making art is hard. It's hard work. People say, I'm block. I have writer's block. I have songwriter's block. I have performer's block. And I think that being having a block is not like having chicken pox or something like that. It's more like the nature of the work. Like the reason we write songs is to figure out something that we're stuck on in our mind. And being blocked is part of the work. The difficulty that we have making things is part of the work. And we may have friends who are much more prolific than we are. That's great for them. But we have to recognize that for us, our work is to do our work. Yeah. And anybody's work is going to be difficult. You can become more facile at it with practice. But by its very nature, it will always be, some part of it, difficult. Yeah, that's so well said. I think many times people think if they're blocked that there's nothing they can do. But the key is being disciplined enough to push through that initial moment of inertia. If you only practiced on the days you really felt motivated to practice, how much further behind would you be than the fact that you've been disciplined all these years? And if you've done the hard part, the process goes back to what you said earlier. You weren't enamored with the outcome so much as in love with the process. Yeah. And I think that for that reason, I think your process has to have both persistence and compassion built into it. So for instance, my writing process is 15 minutes or more a day, five days a week. The reason I said it's so low at 15 minutes is you've got to have a number that is scandalously low that you can hit it even on your worst day. Yeah. And then what happens is, and if you tap out after 15 minutes, that's allowed. What it does is it builds the ability to start. And as any creator will know, the first 15 minutes are the hardest 15 minutes. That's Once it. you get those 15 minutes under your belt, the next 15 are a little easier. And then it's, it's the, the, you, you start to get into a role. And then you, of course you, at a certain point you will become exhausted. But I think that, being compassionate in your goals is what allows you to be also persistent and show up. That's fantastic. I have a post-it stuck on my wall right beside my computer at work that says two crappy pages. And yeah, I, I love to write. And, and I, I don't want, I don't set the bar of writing an entire chapter that doesn't need any more editing. If it's two crappy pages, sometimes you get in that zone and you crank out 20. <laughs> they may still be pretty crappy, yeah. but it's much easier to edit. You get it. 
All right, let's let's close this thing down a little bit here. If you could go back in time and impart some wisdom to young Jacob, what would you tell him? I would say don't let your distaste for your own singing voice dissuade you from writing more songs. That would be one. I would have tried to institute the routine that I have now that I've had for the past 15 years or so as a younger person. I went in and out of having intense, super routines of five hours a day, and then I'd wipe out, and then I'd try and go full bore, and then I'd wipe out again. And I think I would go back to younger Jake and say, hey, man, just try and show up for a little bit on a regular basis. That might work better for you. Yeah. And yeah, and I'd, I'd invite him to be more compassionate with himself. I'd invite him to know that he doesn't have to be hard on himself because he'll always be hard on himself. He doesn't have to go out of his way to do that because that's just built in. And I think that's actually true for a lot of people who are hard on themselves. I think they worry that if they're not hard on themselves, they'll become softies and they'll start slacking. I don't think that's the case. I think actually there's a way in which becoming too hard on yourself is what shuts you down. Yeah. That's wisdom. Uh, young Jake would be <laughs> served to listen well. My next to last question, I love music and the emotions that it can frequently represent. What song would you pick as the soundtrack to a montage of your life and why? It's going to be, you... it's got to be Stevie Wonder. I don't know. For some reason, the, the song Smile Please comes to mind. And I, for no other reason than just the mood of it is, it's both mysterious and joyful and generous. And I think finding the generosity within yourself for yourself and for everybody else is important and, and i feel like stevie wonders music maybe more than anybody else's just kind of overflows with generosity yeah, that's fantastic i've created a spotify playlist with all of my guests pick it's like a mixtape of all of my becoming undone guests and and the, the music that, that they chose from that question last one i ask it of every guest what for you remains undone I've got some books that I want to finish. I think those remain undone. I keep practicing drums and my growth as a drummer will never be done. I think my growth as a writer will never be done. So I don't necessarily know in terms of bucket list items other than like maybe manuscripts I have in progress that I would just love to get done with. But in the bigger picture, I think I just want to continue growing as an artist and making connections with people out in the world to build better communities in the circles that I run in. Those might be my main goals. That's great. I've seen video of you playing a keyboard and drums and even singing maybe all three simultaneously. So as a musician, your dexterity is unmatched. I can remember <laughs> playing a drum set and not being able to communicate and form words to people that were asking me questions. So I can't, I can't do that. I, that's really hard. I don't know how people do. Some people do that and I don't know how the heck they do. Yeah. I, my friends and I, we saw, it was an Eagles video, Don Henley singing lead while playing drums. I'm like, I don't even know how that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> Jake, it's been fantastic. I really appreciate your time. If, uh, folks want to connect and, and follow, whether it's you or, or the band, what are some links they can go to, to to check you out? I'm on Facebook and you can read my blog, which is called portablephilosophy.com. And you can email me at semijake at aol.com. And the band's music is out there on various, Semisonic is, our music is out there on various streaming services and uh, I, we even have vinyl and cd versions of our newest record out so i i would guess those are some of the ways that's super cool as i was reading about your platinum record wondering like what was actually cut into the disc it's what do artists get today for going platinum <laughs> they get some kind of <laughs> digital download with a play button i don't know but yeah you get an uh, email yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it, it's lost some of the luster. I'll never forget the smell of opening a new CD, that, that plasticky scent that my kids don't get. And we didn't really have time to go into it, but but I love that it's a full-length album. So many artists, whatever's going to get the most streams. You tell a story. I appreciate that. Thank you.
Jake, thanks so much. It was great to have you. One last thing, I'll, I'll stitch this in. I just have you state your name, uh, however you would like to introduce yourself and say, and I am undone. Okay. I'm Jacob Slichter. I'm the drummer for Semisonic, and I am undone. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thank you, Toby. I really, I'm... I